afternoon, everyone. Uh, so like you said, my name is Jason Clark. I work for New Relic, uh, specifically on the Ruby agent. So if you've ever installed the New Relic RPM gem into one of your Ruby apps, uh, you've been running some of my code. And so that kind of sets the stage for what this talk is about. Oftentimes when we do our testing, we try to minimize the amount of dependencies that we have that we're going to be interacting with when we do that testing. But that's not always possible. You know, if you're writing a gem that specifically interacts with multiple versions of other gems, you might find yourself in a position where doing that testing in those real scenarios with those dependencies is not something that you can avoid. And so today I'm going to take you through a story. Um, there will be some parts that are fictitious that may be kind of made up. I'll leave it to you to decide which parts are, are false and which are not. Um, but hopefully it will take you through some of the steps that you can have in your mindset for setting up a scenario to test when your dependencies uh, kind of get nasty. So everyone here who's done anything in Ruby in the last couple of years has probably heard of uh, this very popular up and coming framework. It's all the talk, everybody's using it. And that framework, of course, is Ruby on Bales. So the Bales framework came out after the Puma Unicorn Wars of 2018 kind of caused schisms in the web community. It really broke apart the Ruby web development scene. And what that did is it gave an entryway for command line applications to resurge. So Bales was at the forefront of that, making it easy for us to write the sort of command line applications that we wish that we had been writing the whole time. This is a typical Bales app. So this is a command that would allow you to very easily just uh, construct a tweet. And then you can use this from the command line just like you'd like to. You could say Bales tweet the username that you're tweeting from and, and the message. Like this is just about the simplest possible way to get the command line application that you really wish that you had. So of course, every new idea like this that comes along um, generates other ideas in the ecosystem. And so for me, what Bales got me thinking about was how I can measure the productivity that I have when I'm working with these command line apps. So who here has heard of the Pior metric? Anyone? OK, good, because I made it up. So. It would be kind of weird if you had heard of it previously. So this is the programmer input output ratio. So this measures the number of characters that you typed into your command in a ratio to the amount of output that it gave. This is a way better way of measuring your productivity than lines of code. Like this is a great idea for us to be able to see how much the framework is helping us. So of course, being open source, I went to the Bales project and said, hey, can we track this metric? Is this something that we could do? And they very politely said, well, Maybe you could go implement it yourself. That's, you know, that happens. And so the straw project was born. Straw, Bales. No. So straw is a framework that builds on top of Bales to let us uh, take these metrics every time we run a command and gather analytics about the stuff that we're doing. Looks like this in the output. So it gathers up this data that we can do things on. Um, tells you the length of the output. So that's important for calculating our, our ratio. It tells us the things that were typed in as parameters. It tells us in the second column whether there's an error. Everything we need to be able to generate the data that we really want to off of these commands. Now at this point you might be thinking, what on earth is this guy talking about? Why are, why are we going down this little fantasy track? But here's where we're going to get started with the real meat of it. As a good Rubyist, I wanted to have this stuff be well tested. And so I wrote tests. There are tests against this, and they run actual Bales commands, instantiating their runner, and asserting that I wrote to my data store with the things that I expected. So this is checking with the dependency on Bales that my code plugging into Bales does what I expect it to do. Now the tests throughout this will be fairly simple and short, and they're written in many tests. You know, a lot of these principles would apply whatever sort of framework you were choosing to use. All is well with the world. My tests pass, and straw 1.0 ships, and people all over the place are figuring out uh, just how productive they can be with command line apps. But the open source world never really stands still, and Bales 2 comes out. Now, this didn't really make any major changes for straw. Straw was still able to build on top of that fine, but it raised a question. Like, I run these unit tests. 
I've been running them against one version of Veil. I've been running them against just this one dependency. How do I make sure that I can test against both of those? And just as a side note, I'm really glad that Joan in plus one this. It was very helpful <laughs> for him to leave that comment for us. Luckily, there are tools that we all interact with on a day-to-day -day basis from Ruby that allow us to build the structure that we need to do that testing in multiple environments. And Bundler is key to that. So almost everybody has probably written an application and used a gem file if you've written a Ruby app and you specify the gem dependencies that you have. But something that you might not know is that it doesn't have to necessarily be named gem file and it doesn't necessarily have to live in the root of your application. So the step that we're going to take to start getting ourselves into testing with these multiple versions is we're going to make multiple gem files in our test directory. I've named them to represent the versions and kind of the set of dependencies that we're going to test together. So we have our gem file for Bales 1.0, and now we're introducing a gem file for Bales 2.0. These look just like a perfectly normal gem file. The contents are exactly what you would expect, and you can fill out all of the information that you need for any set of dependencies within your test. All right, so I've got a way to spell this out, but how do I get my test to actually run using those dependencies? Well, Bundler comes again to the rescue. There's an environment variable called bundle gem file. Most of the time you don't have to interact with this. If you're just using a standard gem file, it will default to that. But this will override where Bundler looks for the gem file that it's going to load. In this case, I'm doing an export of it just to get it on a separate line, but you can also do it in line with whatever command you're executing. And so here we would set our gem file to the Bales 1.0 definitions that we put in our test directory, and then we can just run our tests as we did before, confident in the knowledge that that is loading that alternate environment for us. The output looks something like this, and everything is good. But now, we've introduced a little bit of extra complexity in our testing environment. It used to be that running the test was we ran rake test, and that was it. We just did one thing. And now, potentially, we have this explosion coming of different versions and different sets of permutations that we might care about. So we want to give ourselves a little bit of a hint if we're ever looking at a lot of output and how to, how to tell which dependencies we're actually running under in any given case. So what we can do is, in our test helper file, we can put something like this, running with Bales version. And this will provide us output when we're running in the context of a given test run that tells us what we're actually running against. So this can be very helpful for distinguishing between different test runs on your CI box or somewhere where you're doing multiple different things. But Bundler actually lets us do even better than this and give ourselves extra information. It has a definition. And that specs list holds on to a list of the spec objects that it has chosen to load. And so this will represent all of the dependencies. If there are nested dependencies, if Bales had other things that it depended on, all of those are going to be present in that specs collection. And we can spit that out instead of just that single version. And now we can see the entire context of this test run with all of the things that are there. Now, this may not seem like much here, but if you had a very large set of dependencies, potentially with other sub-dependencies, which could vary by minor versions between one machine and another. This can be very helpful for debugging why something might break in one environment and not on your local machine, for instance. So that's all well and good, but I don't know about you. I don't want to type bundle gem file equals something, something, something every single time. So we're going to make a rake test to put this all together and make it simpler for us to access and run. And we'll take a look at how that's structured next. I'll call it multiverse because we're running in all of these separate little gem universes. The task is fairly straightforward. By default, if we don't give it any parameters, it's going to use rake's file list to look in our test directory and find any of these gem files, these alternate gem files that we specified. Then we're going to step through each of those individual gem files. And then we will backtick, so this will start a separate process and run the tests with that gem file, just like we had done at the command line manually a moment or two ago. So when we run this test, we do rake multiverse, it will step through all of the possible combinations that we've got in our test directory. Now, that's not always what we want to do. Sometimes we want to focus, and we maybe know that we're working on a bug that's in one particular version of Bales or trying to just narrow down possibilities. When those are the case, we can 
pass a parameter to rake in the format that it looks for, these square brackets on the command line. And then instead, we select, um, we use that in the glob that we pass to the file list. And so this will select just the files that include the text that we passed in. So this will let us, you know, focus it down to just the set that we want to run at any given time. So, you know, the work of an open source maintainer is never done. Um, got this bug that rake multiverse was failing on a clean repo. So who was the, oh yeah, so this was actually my boss who logged this. So I guess we should probably look, look pretty closely at it. Um, so the problem here was that somebody pulled this down clean onto their machine and tried to run it. And they didn't have all of the gems that were installed from all of those other gem files. Like nobody's gone and done a bundle install for it. So, we need to work around that. Our test script is going to need to do the setup for us in these cases. You might think, well, it works on my machine, but you know, you want your scripts to be bulletproof. You really want your repo to pull down and be able to run things clean. So, let's look at a solution. You can remember how to do this solution by the acronym ABC. Always bundle constantly. This is actually just, I think, a good refrain for Ruby developers in general. <laughs> tends to be the way to do it. Um, so, what's this look like in practice? Well, pretty straightforward. I pulled out the bundled gem file and set it directly in the env hash of the parent process now, just so I don't have to append it in front of every single command that's given, because this is gonna grow a little bit and we'll see some, uh, some other pieces coming in. But we bundle install, and then we turn around and run our tests. So now, somebody can pull this down onto their machine and it will do the installations that are necessary for any of those given environments to run. But this has a little bit of a downside to it and that running a bundle install every single time you run the tests goes and talks across the network, does quite a bit of work. Even if you don't have any changes, it's kind of heavy. So we would like to make that load a little lighter. You know, we can't get rid of this install step entirely, but what we can do is we can tell bundler to try to just use what's locally available. And so if you already have all of the gems that you need and if everything is properly resolved, then this will go very quickly. And then dollar, uh, dollar question mark tells us the return from the last child process that we spawned. So the back tick on the line above. As long as that succeeded, then we can carry on and run our tests. And if it didn't succeed, then we fall back, give a little message, and we go do the full bundle install. We gotta download stuff and then install it all from scratch. Once that's all done, then we should be back in a position where we can just go run the tests and all is well. So on the internet, someone's always willing to tell you that you're wrong. Um, and in this case, eh, he might have a point. Um, so this is one of the pieces that I will tell you is actually true and actually exists. The appraisal gem pretty much does exactly what we've just walked through. So it gives you a way to set up multiple gem files to run your tests against. So let's take a quick look at what that would look like in practice. Uh, it's got quite a few downloads, so it's a good real gem. In appraisals, rather than just hand coding separate gem files, what you do is you make an appraisal file in the root of your directory, and you give names for the various sections. And one of the nice parts about this is that all you do in the blocks is you give it the delta between um, the appraisal file and your core gem file for the gem that you're testing. And appraisals will merge those together to generate the full gem file. So if there, you'll notice like I don't have the mini test dependencies and the rake dependencies all spelled out in these, um, in the appraise because that's in my main gem file. You run appraisal install and it generates for you all of the files very much like what we had just hand coded to set up. Appraisals, then you run it, tell it which of the groups you want to run it with, and then you give it an arbitrary command. So this is one of the nice parts about this is that it allows you to run any command that's within your application. So if you had other scripts or if you wanted to, if you had some sort of web server or other app that runs, you can use appraisals to run it with a particular set of dependencies. So this is a really good thing. If like what you're looking for is just some basic version and dependency um, grouping, Appraisals will take you a lot of the way there. But we've got some other destinations I'd like to look at a little bit further to push our testing. So we'll stick with the, uh, the testing framework that we've built so far and grow it a little further down the track. 
the work of an open source maintainer is never done. So, I don't know, we can talk to Tim later about his use of antique technologies, but apparently he's been still using the 0 0.8 release of Bales, which is really old. I don't know why anybody would do that. Um, but, you know, even though this isn't a version of things that I want to support, I don't want my code to make things blow up when it's used in the presence of that. So let's take a look at how we can set this up and do the testing that we need to to make sure that we're safe in the presence of dependencies that we maybe didn't expect. First off, we'll create a new, uh, a new gem file for the bad dependency. This is a dependency that we, we wish we didn't have to support, but we need to do a little something about. And sure enough, if we go and run the code, we get a failure, undefined method run for the Bales runner. Well, a little bit of spelunking reveals that sometime before the 1.0 release, one of the methods that we're patching to take our metrics uh, changed its name from execute to run. So that's the core of what's wrong here. Now this, this is the point in time when as a gem author, you need to decide what you're going to do. Now we could update our code so that it works on the old version, or we could just say we're not going to support that, but we're going to do it cleanly so that nothing breaks. And that's the path that we'll take here just for simplicity's sake. You know, it is a zero, it is a pre 1.0 release. We don't want to keep supporting that into, into the future. So how do we go about doing this? First off, we add a method that goes in, does the inspection to try to figure out whether we think that this is an environment that we can run in. So in this case, we're just going to do a simple version check. And I'll make a side note that this is not the right way to do version checking. This is not safe in all, all cases, but this is the simplest way to write it uh, for the presentation. And if you have single digit numbers, it all compares fine. Um, you're OK until you hit 1.10. So this will help us to, to know when we're in a state where we can actually do the things that we want to do. Now you may need to do more rigorous checks than this. This might be a point in time when you want to look and see whether certain other classes exist, whether classes have methods that you're expecting them to have. You know, you can be as defensive as you want to, and Ruby's introspection will let you be as thorough as you need to before you start building your stuff on top of it. But luckily for us, simple version checks should get us on down the road. So how do we put this into practice? Oh, side note, speaking of gem versions, um, if you are a gem author and the only place that your version number shows up is in a hard-coded string in your gem spec like this, please don't do that. So that makes it so that I, as another gem author, cannot do this because the information that's in that gem spec is not available to me at runtime. So make sure that you make a constant and use that constant in your gem spec rather than baking it in there. Now, you might think, well, that seems obvious, but I can tell you there are a number of prominent projects that I will not name that don't do this, and it makes my life rather hellish writing the Ruby agent. So put your version numbers where they belong in a constant for my sanity, if nothing else. Moving on, though, looking at Bales uh, and how we would use this support method. So in our tests, our tests don't apply anymore, right? We can't run a test that actually checks that we do instrumentation on that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to block out those tests and make sure that they only run if we are in the presence of a supported version. Now this is one of the beautiful things about Ruby, that this is just more Ruby code. That if, just a normal if, around the definition of this class, and if we don't get into that if block, we don't define the tests so we don't run them. Everything is good. But this doesn't actually prove that we are safe. This keeps our tests from failing because we don't run them. But this doesn't show that we're OK in the presence of that other gem. So how do we write some tests that ensure that we're not doing the wrong thing when we're on an unsupported version? Well, we can negate the condition and write some tests that check that ourselves. Now, there are a couple of different ways. And what you're doing will change what these different um, tests might look like. But a couple of ways that you could go about it. So here, what we do is we write a test that runs the Bales runner. So this runs the, the base framework. But then we assert that nothing got, we didn't ever try to write to our data store. So this is kind of a proxy for saying we never tried to instrument anything because we never wrote to any of the locations we were trying to write to. 
In this case, I'm taking the writer that Straw uses to write the data out, and just replacing it with a bare object, which is not going to respond to any of the writing methods. So if anything ever tries to touch it and write to it, we're going to get an exception. Another way that you can go about this, again, is Ruby's introspection. If you know that there are certain objects which you're going to be patching or modifying, or classes that you're going to be defining, you can check that those things exist or don't, and make sure that you haven't done any of the work that you're supposed to exclude. So with these tests in place, then that would drive me to write the right code in the framework, in Straw, to make sure that it's not instrumenting things if it's not on a supported version. And then we can rest assured that even if we get installed on a version that we don't know about, we're going to be safe and we're going to do the right thing. So, open source, new versions keep coming. Bales 3.0 came out. And unlike the 2.0 release, which didn't have any new functionality, um, 3.0 actually had a really cool feature, which is unrunning a command. Right? It's like undo for the command line. Back's the thing. No? Nobody's nearly as excited as I am about this. But, okay, here's what it looks like in practice. So you can give an unrun for your command. And then when you run that at the command line, it backs out, deletes the data, does whatever you need to do. Okay. So this is, this is pretty cool. And we want to make sure that our add-on works properly with this. So what do we do? We write a test. So if we say Bales Runner, then we should untweet, and that'll We'll just say that it tries to untweet the last thing that I tweeted and check that it writes the right thing to our logging. Okay? So this test against the new version checks, checks the behavior that we want. So we run it, and everything is good. Everything's green. Turns out our instrumentation is resilient enough that it didn't really need to change anything. We hooked the right points, and everything behaves like we'd expect it to on the new version. Hooray! But what do you think happens when we run this test, when we run against the old version? Any guesses? Failure. So we wrote a test that exercises functionality that didn't exist in the old version of Bales. So what we get is an unexpected result, and the one there indicates that this command exited with an error because it didn't know what to do. It doesn't know about this untweet. That doesn't even exist back in 2.0. So here we are again with a case where some of the work that we're doing needs to be gated off. And again, Ruby's, uh, Ruby's power allows us to get around this pretty easily. There's a couple of different flavors of how we can take care of it. So one simple way is just to do a version check around the individual tests that you're dealing with. So in this case, we say, hey, we're not even going to test the unrunning command if we're not on at least this version of Bales or Forward. I've also seen it done this way. Your mileage may vary whether one of those flavors uh, looks better to you or not to return from within the method or, or gate around it. But I actually like a third approach to this, and that is to remember that test files don't have to be coupled directly to just the classes, the individual classes that you're testing against. You can make a test file named whatever you want. And so what I'll often do for new functionality that's optional or that only appears in some versions is I'll extract specific tests for those into their own file and then follow this pattern with it. So specifically, making an if that will tell me and give output when I'm not running that test. Now, the reason that I want to do this is because that conditional where I decide whether to run the test or not, that's a piece of code. That's a piece of code that I wrote that I might have screwed up. I might have botched the version check. I might have gotten the wrong range. I might not be running the test when I think that I am. And not running a test is kind of hard to spot. It's just one of those dots in there. The, the total doesn't add up to the thing that you thought it would. And so what this does is it makes it very explicit when we're skipping a test that we're not running that code. And I can make sure that the output for that is what I expect it to be. And as versions progress, if there's some reason that that conditional grows or some reason that something changes, I'll know if these tests are being skipped in a scenario where I think that they ought to have actually run. So having caution when you're skipping tests is a really good thing. Giving yourself the output to be able to figure out that you're not doing some of your testing in a certain scenario is really helpful 
and uh, we'll avoid you skipping over tests that you didn't mean to skip. So that's a lot of bails, but every good framework, every good idea that comes along, you know, stirs up somebody else to maybe take a different slant on it, to find a different way that they think is the right way to do it. And Crooner came along after Bales as kind of a response to that. It, it felt like Bales was too heavy, did too many things. You know, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And I got to admit, you know, there's definitely less code there. There's, you know, you don't define a class. There's fewer methods. There's a little bit less baggage, and you know, it pretty much works the same way. You can write the same sorts of things, express those semantics, and so. As the developer of Straw, I really wanted to have things work with both of these major platforms that came along and got popular. You know, I want these metrics across all the commands that I run, not just the ones that happen to be implemented in one framework or another. So what we're going to do to get around this is we're going to introduce a, a concept that I'm going to call test suites. So a suite of tests is a set of test files that apply to a given framework. So to date, we've just been writing a big pile of test files that all run against Bales. Well now, some tests are going to be against Bales, and I'm going to have a different set of tests that I only want to run against Crooner. And so those two suites will be separated. They'll be able to have their own tests and their own sets of dependencies. And we'll be able to run them independently. So part of doing this, um, it became easier to kind of pull out our test runner into a separate file. And so our multiverse task here has slimmed down a little. It, it gains some functionality around finding suites. And so you can pass in the suite name that you want and then the gem files. You can also still do some of that filtering. And what we do to actually run our tests, instead of doing a rake test invocation, is we just do a Ruby execution of our test runner and pass it the suite and gem file that it's supposed to run. Now that test runner, Looks pretty simple, but you know it takes over a little bit of what we were relying on Rake to do for us. Sets up some of our load paths, and then specifically it looks for all of the files in the suite directory now. And so that's what gets us kind of that filtering and focusing on just one set of tests that we want to run. And by convention, we'll just put it in test and then the name of the suite as the directory. Those all get required, and uh, by the magic of the test helper and many tests auto run, Requiring all those files is enough to then run the tests. So this allows us to do uh, something like this. Once we've written up a little bit of our crooner code, we've got a test or two here. We can rake multiverse crooner. Then it will just run the tests that are appropriate for that. And all of the Bales tests don't necessarily get run. But of course, you get into a big feature. You start implementing. And what happens? an unrelated bug comes up from somebody else. So bundle exec rake multiverse fails. We end up with this, it gets kind of an odd, odd message for it to get. You know, I'll admit, I've, I've always just been doing rake multiverse. Like I never even thought to bundle exec on that because I knew that my tests inside were gonna be loading the right gem files. So never occurred to me to put bundle exec, but okay. So digging in, it was an interesting thing to see this because it helped me to understand a little bit more of the magic of what Bundler is doing behind the scenes for us. So when we bundle exec and then run rake, this task is running in the context of the gem file that is in my, uh, my gems directory. It's in, in that context. It's loaded up the gems that uh, my root gem file has set are there. And that's all well and good, but another thing that Bundler does is it patches itself in so that when we try to launch a subshell, when we do the back ticks, it's effectively like this. So it makes sure that any subshell, any subprocess that we spawn, will end up with the same environment that it has loaded. And so it will say, hey, your gem file is going to be this, and the Ruby ops there will make sure that Bundler loads itself like right when the Ruby process starts. And so before my test runner ever has a chance to actually override what gem file is being used, Bundler will already have loaded itself with that root file. And because of how Bundler works, once it thinks it's set up, it won't do the setup again. And so later on, when I've reconfigured to go look for my special gem file, Bundler's like, mm, no, I'm not going to do that. I already loaded. I'm done. 
Luckily, Bundler knew about this and knew that people might have scenarios where they needed to get out of that. And so they provided the with clean env. So what this will do is this makes it so that that subshell magic where it adds those environment variables doesn't happen. And so this Ruby invocation here that I'm doing in the back ticks will happen clean. And then internally when I load a gem file and set the environment, it's going to actually load. It will be the first time that Bundler's been loaded in that process. And we end up with the things that we actually want. So, I mean, it's good when people are looking at your project and are, you know, making commentary. It means they're trying to use it right. And, and it was right. Like, it, the tests aren't as fast as they could be. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can slice the performance. We could try to actually make the tests themselves faster. But we're also doing a lot of different things with different processes. Like, you know, maybe, maybe a forking model would be a good way that we could speed this up. But lucky timing, I'm glad I didn't invest in doing the forking sort of approach because this came in as well. So I hadn't thought of it, but apparently somebody's running bails on JRuby, and JRuby runs on the JVM and doesn't have fork. So a forking model just isn't really going to be workable for us if we want to keep supporting JRuby. So I've got an alternative to this that I want to show you, and it involves threads instead of um, forking processes to manage it. So what we do is in our test task, uh, we initialize a variable where we're going to hold on to a set of threads. Inside of our bundler with clean, instead of directly backticking and running that process there, we will spawn a new thread, and that thread is going to turn around and start the child process and do the output from one individual test run. So this will tally up each of those threads, and each thread runs concurrently and lets each of the child processes start, and then waits for those child processes to exit. At the end of things, we wait for all of the threads to join back, so that makes sure everybody finishes, and then we get out just like we would um, before. The output is taken care of by the backticking line. Everything is good. Every, all the tests run in parallel. Test performance is back up. But there's a problem with this code. Um, yeah, apparently running make. So, you know, I mean, the reason that I didn't notice this is my tests don't fail. So I hadn't noticed that the tests weren't failing properly because they hadn't broken. I don't know that. I don't know if anyone else has that problem, but no. So in all seriousness, the code that we just wrote introduced this problem. So I think there's an easy way that we can work around it. What we'll do is we'll lean on the fact that um, a zero status tells us that everything is fine. And so as each of those processes finish, we can take their exit status, and if we simply add it into the status variable that we're tracking, if anybody has failed, then we'll be a failure as well. We make sure at the end of things that we're going to exit with that same status code that we've tallied up. If all of the tests passed, they all return zero. We return a zero. Everything is good. If anybody returns a failure, the whole thing's a failure. You know, and you can deal with uh, making the output nicer if you want or highlighting things. We've done that in the Ruby agent as well. Boy, Kay was finding all sorts of stuff. She put a binding pry in there. Is this a threading bug? I mean, that seems, seems kind of like it might be related. So why can't we debug? It turns out that it's not the threads. It's actually the child process here. So the way that backticking works is when we run that backtick, it's going to execute that command, run it in another shell, run it to completion, and then take all of the output and hand it back to us as a string, and we're just putting it out. So when she's seeing things actually hanging, what's really happening is we're hitting the breakpoint in the test. Pry has spit a bunch of things out. It's spit out a console for you to interact with that will not be shown until the process exits and finishes and hands things back. So interestingly, if you type commands, like if she typed to continue past that pry that she put in, the process would continue and finish. And when you saw the output, you would see all of the debugging where pry had interjected itself. Well, so this is kind of a problem. Like, we want people to be able to um, debug into their stuff. So let's take a swipe at figuring out how to fix it. Along the way, 
our test file, our test runner, we've actually extracted it into a class. Pretty much does the same things that we do. It's just that it does it within a run method. And this gives us the tool that we need to be able to make a debuggable version of our multiverse tests. So it looks like this. So if we say run the tests and break serial and give it the same suite and gem file, rather than backticking out to a Ruby execution, which will go and spin this stuff up, we'll just take that same test runner class and we will just run it directly here. Now, this has the downside that we can only do this for one shot. This will load a gem file with a particular environment and a particular set of stuff, and once that's loaded, that's what this process is going to do. But, you know, if you're debugging into things, that's probably enough. Um, you may not need to have it go through multiple different iterations, and you can always rerun the task if you need to see what it's doing in a different version. So, Today, we've taken a look at a lot of different things. We've kind of built out a test environment for running things in multiple ways. Bundler was a big piece of that. It provides us a lot of tools for managing our dependencies in Ruby for more than just having a gem file that lets you not have to hand install your stuff. We've also seen a few little tricks that you can do with Rake. It's a really nice tool. Uh, you should definitely dig into it. The file lists and uh, task management are really, really top notch there. We've looked a lot at how to manage different versions, what to do when your code has different behavior against different versions of your dependencies. And we've looked at how to parallelize that, uh, that test execution to keep your times down because as you support more and more versions of things, you know, things are going to get slower and you want that feedback loop to stay as tight as possible. And lastly, we've looked at how you can break your tests up, break them up into suites so that you can focus on areas Focus on sets of dependencies that you want to. Hopefully, this has given you some ideas so that your testing can look more like this sort of scenario and less like this. Thank you. Mm -hmm.